to y'all. For those of us that are Irish by ancestry or Irish by choice for today, um, welcome. And for those of us that aren't, welcome. We welcome everybody. And I didn't even say, my name is Penny, and <laughs> it's good to see all your smiling faces. Uh, um, on Friday, March 29th, starting at 6 p.m., there will be a women's history event here, highlighting the struggle for abortion rights in Pensacola and UUCP's involvement in that struggle. There will be a panel discussion featuring our own Paula Montgomery and other local figures, as well as a short film. Join us on Friday, March 29th at 6 p.m. here for this important event. And there is a flyer posted on the bulletin board. And I want to say that um, our lovely piano with a beautiful sound uh, was um, dedicated to a member of ours that was killed in escorting a doctor and his wife was also wounded. Um, so we have a strong history with this topic. Now is the time for opening words and our chalice lighting. This is adapted from Betsy Durr. May the light of this chalice Give, oh, may, the li may this chalice <laughs> give light and warmth to our community when we are joyful and when we despair. And may we feel the warmth spread from our circle to wider and wider circles until all know they belong to the one circle of life. We now have a brief slide that we're hoping will work for us. Um, we are Unitarian Universalists, and this is what we're about. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people of many paths who are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. Every day, people are inundated with information, overwhelmed by demands and pulled by a culture that seeks to divide us from the web of life. Unitarian Universalism reconnects, bringing people together with meaning and inspiration. We are a house without walls, a congregation without spiritual limits, and a movement that calls you to put more faith in yourself, your community, and your beliefs. We are a faith that honors your mind, your heart, your journey. Simply put, we are a guided path towards a better you and a better world. Grounded in hundreds of years of thoughtful religious communities, we are people of many generations, ethnicities, genders and sexualities, and spiritual backgrounds. People engaged in making the world a better place. People focusing on what really matters, love, justice, integrity, and hope. Unitarian Universalists have different beliefs, but shared values. We are Unitarian Universalists, and at the same time, we may also be agnostic, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, humanist, Jewish, Muslim, pagan, atheist, believers in God, and those who let the great mystery be. The diversity of beliefs you'll find in a Unitarian Universalist community is one of our strengths. We're always learning how to see the world from a different perspective. What unites us are our core principles that uphold seven real-world values, believing in the worthiness of every person, showing compassion and fairness, accepting others for who they are, growing through a personal search for truth, leading with democratic spirit, working for justice, and understanding that everything is interconnected. 
Seven days a week, Unitarian Universalists live these principles by doing. When we gather, we worship, reflect, and remind ourselves what matters most in life. Whatever our age, we learn to live with more wisdom, more awareness, more gratitude, and more soul. We show our values by showing up to answer the call for social justice. We have a track record of standing on the side of love for civil rights, LGBTQ equality, immigration reform, environmental sustainability, reproductive justice, racial justice, and more. Find what it means to live your deepest values out loud. Join us on this extraordinary adventure of faith. You're busy people. <laughs> this is the time for our covenant, which will be on the screen. Uh, if stand as you're willing and able. <laughs> and um, you can remain standing afterwards at, at, for our hymn, which will be I'll tell you that when that comes. <laughs> Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Okay, our song, and if you're comfortable standing, do. If you need to sit, that's fine, is Building Bridges. It's in the blue hymnal, number 1023. And are the words up here too? No, not on this one. Okay, not, not on this one. So the blue, hymn, the teal hymnal. All right, folks, you may notice this is a round, and we're going to divide the congregation into two parts, that side and that side. And the first side will be that side, which is your left, and you will come in at the beginning, and then the second group will come in, and, come on up, y'all, and the second group will come in when the first group gets to the little three, and they're singing the words, gets to all of us.
That was beautiful. Okay, we're, we have a slide for the <coughs> children, and um, it is up here, and so please enjoy. For those young at heart and young in age. This is singing the children out. supporting through our own contributions and our small little fundraisers. Um, the um, greeters will be passing um, a basket. If we ask that if it is going towards your pledge, if you can put it in an envelope or somehow notify that you want it credited towards your pledge, please do so. And thank you very much. contributions and thank you Mike and Ray. Uh, we have a meditation hymn. Uh, it will be on slides um, on the, up here. We have sung it before in the congregation and it is very lovely. Um, we hope you'll join us. You may be seated for this because it's a meditative time.
Dr. Lauren Anzalda will be um, speaking to us on our solemn promise. Um, and she has been with us a long time. And I'm just going to let her get to it. I needed that slide to be up there so I could start my talk. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, we tend to see a lot of rainbows in March, hence the picture behind me, since rainbows are associated with leprechauns and pots of gold and St. Patrick's Day, which is today. But the rainbow is also symbolic of a well-known covenant that we're going to touch on this morning. A covenant is a solemn promise that we make to one another. One of the interesting things about the word covenant is that it is both a noun and a verb. As a noun, a covenant is a written agreement. As a verb, to covenant means to make those mutual agreements. When we enter into a covenant, we covenant together. So today's message deals with the meaning of covenants and their importance. Covenants appear within many religious traditions, including the Judeo-Christian tradition from which Unitarian Universalism arose. One of the most well-known stories in the Judeo-Christian tradition is a story of covenant, the story of Noah's Ark. Noah and the Ark are found in the Old Testament book of Genesis. God decided to destroy the world, which had grown wicked in God's eyes. But Noah and his family were righteous, and Noah was obedient, so God promised to save them. God gave Noah the instructions, and Noah built an ark for him and his family members, and gathered pairs of animals to take on the ark. We, we know that story, right? At least part of it. After they had boarded the ark, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, and the waters rose. The flood lasted for 150 days. Every living creature on the earth died, except for the ones on the ark. Mark Woods writes the following in the publication Christian Today. In Genesis 9, 12 through 17, after the floods have gone down, God says he will make a covenant with human beings and that the rainbow will be a sign of it. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between man and the earth. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Woods continues, but why should it be a rainbow? One reason is that there's a sort of poetic appropriateness about it. Rainbows appear after storms as the light from the sun hits the water droplets in the air and breaks into the different colors we don't normally see. A light rain may still be falling, but generally speaking, you know when you see the rainbow that no matter how fierce the storm may have been, it is over. The rainbow remains for many a symbol of a literal promise that God made to Noah and the survivors of that destructive flood, that God would not again annihilate the people of earth by flood waters. The other major covenant discussed in the Old Testament is God's promise to Abraham that he would be a father of nations. You may recall that Abraham was the man who held such an unwavering belief in God that he obeyed God's command to kill his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice. When God saw that Abraham was willing to follow through on this command, God spared Isaac and blessed Abraham, and he had many, many offspring, even though he was a very old man at the time. Abraham is now known as the father of three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which are all considered Abrahamic faiths after Abraham. In the article, God's Own Covenant, Daniel Kastny writes, the theme of the covenant in the Old Testament is at the starting point of all religious thought, distinguishing Judaism from all the surrounding religions that were aimed at the worship of idols and gods of nature. Kastny says, Yahweh is the Lord who fulfills his promise given to Israel. Covenant is a defining concept of the monotheistic Judaic religion. Covenant is what marks the Jewish people as, quote, God's chosen people. As the religion of the Old Testament gives way to the New Testament, the original covenant between God and God's followers has been fulfilled through Abraham's descendants, 
God issues a new covenant of grace through the sacrifice of Jesus, which creates a special relationship between God and God's people, at least for those who believe in the new covenant, who are known as Christians. To continue in Cassini's words, in the Bible, the theme of the covenant is interwoven with the fundamental idea of God's salvation of man through the establishment of intimate communion with him. Such a relationship between master and servant is characteristic of the relationship between God and Yahweh and Israel. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the covenant is characterized by a master-servant relationship, a relationship of obedience. So why am I talking about all this? I'm talking about new, you know, old covenant, new covenant. This is really important for some of us who may not know about some of that, that this really informs a lot of what we see today in terms of certain rhetoric. So that's important, but covenant, in other words, has been a big deal for a very long time, and it, it has a history there. So that's also important for us to recognize it's not really something to be taken out of context because it informs so much of what we're seeing today. And I get into a little bit more about that later in terms of the political situation. Covenant is obviously regarded differently within UU congregations, okay? Our covenants are between individuals who enter freely into agreements. You use covenant with one another as equals or as peers. As you use, our congregational covenant binds us together in relationship as we promise to try to be our best selves and to uphold our values within our church and outside its walls. You may have heard it said, I know I've said it before in explanation, that Unitarian Universalism is a covenantal faith, not a creedal faith. And what does that mean? Because these are not words we necessarily use all the time. A creed is a set of fundamental beliefs. In creedal traditions, I came from a creedal tradition in childhood, many of us may have, a creed is usually confessed or recited together formally. For instance, some of you may be familiar with a very well-known creed called the Apostles' Creed, which starts, I believe in God the Father Almighty. So creedal religious communities usually recite their creeds or their fundamental beliefs together during worship services. But you use do not subscribe to a shared set of beliefs. We may all believe different things about the nature of our existence, the re reason we are here, and where we're going. So there are many differences between us. Like we heard in the video earlier, we have different beliefs but shared values. Our covenant then is what unites us as you use. When we join this congregation and when we say our liturgical covenant together during each Sunday service, that's the one we recite during our services, we affirm the way we treat one another and the kind of people we strive to be. Here is where our UU covenantal faith does share a practice with other religious traditions. The author Cassini writes about covenant and he makes this assertion. A covenant is a contract between all who are bound by common interests and responsibilities, which is concluded by a certain ceremonial act. So signing a pledge is one common ceremonial act. When a person joins our congregation and becomes a member of UUCP, they sign our membership book. Signing the book is a gesture of their agreement to be in covenant with us. After signing the book, incoming members also participate in a new member ceremony where we all recite our congregational covenant together and commit to right relations and engagement in this community. For the new members, they are entering into covenant with us, while we existing members are renewing our covenant. And it is a meaningful ceremony, I, I think. If you haven't been a part of one, we do have a new member ceremony scheduled on April 7th, and we will be welcoming into membership at least two new members. So that'll, you'll get to see it in person if you haven't. I think most of you here have seen that before because you all look pretty familiar to me. Um, so what is it that we're agreeing to when we covenant together here at UUCP? We said this together just a few minutes ago. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. So to begin with, we affirm love and service. Service flows from a loving heart. We want to help the folks that we love. And we also listen to and respect their needs and the needs that they may express. 
We, we care about them. We pay attention and we want to help them. We hold realistic expectations and we understand that we are all human and we all have limitations. The Reverend Rene Rohutsky, a consultant with the UUA, shares an allegory that illustrates the values of love and service. She describes the excitement of a backyard berry patch bursting with juicy, flavorful berries during the summer season. The promise of delicious berries all year long tempts her to buy berries at the grocery store during the off season when the backyard berry patch isn't producing anything. But those store-bought berries just don't taste as good as the fresh backyard berries. Rohutsky writes, our modern international food supply web has created expectations of fresh fruit all year long. The reality is that growing seasons need to be balanced with fallow seasons. Consumers have a seemingly endless supply of fresh berries, but they may not notice that the berries come from different parts of the Western Hemisphere, depending on the month. Rohutsky continues, Sometimes we see consumer expectations show up in our faith communities when it comes to Sunday services, religious exploration, and so on. The work of the staff and the lay leadership can be out of sight and out of mind. We can take people for granted and not recognize and appreciate the hard work that they are doing, the emotional and intellectual energy that this work often takes which can sometimes look so easy from a distance. UUCP is not a spectator sport, to borrow a phrase. We are not here as observers or consumers. We are participants, especially given that we are a lay-led congregation without a minister and with minimal staff members. It is imperative that we recognize that we do the work of this congregation. Our general upkeep, our Sunday services, our children's programming, etc. We, as the congregants of UUCP, are responsible for those functions. Our love for this community and our love for one another spur us to service. The next element of our covenant speaks to dwelling in peace. Dwell is a word that means to live in a particular way. In this case, to live together in peace, peacefully. Dwelling in peace suggests experiencing a level of comfort with one another, that we feel at peace with one another, regardless of differences that we may have. A few months ago, I read a book by Krista Tippett called Becoming Wise, Inquiry into the Mystery and Art of Living. This book is actually what inspired me to reach out to Nancy and propose the topic that I'm giving here today. Many of you are probably familiar with Krista Tippett. She's a journalist and host of the long-running radio program On Being. In the book, Becoming Wise, Tippett presents interviews and conversations with various thinkers, philosophers, writers, and religious persons that she has spoken with in her work as a journalist. In the book, Richard Rodriguez, who's an essayist and a Catholic, ruminated on the power of ritual, ritual in religious communities. Rodriguez observes that the consistency of our religious communities embraces us through many seasons of life and provides us with strengths to go on and even to draw meaning from our suffering. Rodriguez remarks, the seasons of grief and triumph, the seasons of renewal and sorrow, the power of religion to make us reflective of the lives we are leading seems to me to encourage an inwardness, which I would call intellectual. Consolation of the inner life, that is no small gift. We covenant to dwell together in peace, to foster a space where we can be comfortable and accepted, embraced and supported, and safe to explore our inner life and to go deeper, and that is no small gift. The next element of our covenant deals with seeking the truth in love. UUs are known to be seekers and skeptics, which generally means that we are not satisfied with just one answer, so we spend a lot of time seeking truth, <laughs> right? Our seeking can bump up against the seeking of others with viewpoints that clash. It is a good thing we can temper our seeking with love or else we would get pretty prickly and tough to be around. 
thinking that we know everything and that others are wrong, and we don't try to do that. To return to Tippett's book, Becoming Wise, our section, our one section of the book presents some conversations by uh, some observations by Vincent Harding, who's a historian, a devout Christian, civil rights activist, and was a speechwriter for the Reverend Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Harding refers to democratic conversations. He observes that democratic conversations open up the question of what it means to be truly human. And here he sounds very much like a UU. He asks, what is our purpose in this world? And is that purpose related to our responsibilities to each other and to the world itself? Harding observes, we are absolutely amateurs at this matter of building a democratic nation made up of many, many peoples of many kinds, from many connections and convictions and from many experiences. After all the pain we have caused each other, it is a challenge to know how to carry on democratic conversations that in a sense invite us to hear each other's best arguments and best contributions so that we can then figure out how do we put those things together to create a more perfect union. Within these democratic conversations, seeking the truth first starts from a place of love and respect, inviting others' voices and listening to hear and to understand. Listening to hear and to understand. A little Stephen Covey in there, for those who know where others are coming from, understand where others are coming from. The publication, Behavioral Covenants in Congregations, a handbook for honoring differences, notes that the vitality and the life source of our faith depends upon our differences, our differences as we seek new ways to be authentic and faithful in a time of changing assumptions. That sounds very much like our current moment, right? Except I think that book was written like 20 or 30 years ago, but I guess we're always in a situation where we depend upon diversity and ways to be authentic in a time of changing assumptions. We're always going through something, it just seems like more now. The handbook presents an example of seeking the truth in love as it describes two religious communities in a small Dakota town. Both communities were divided by deep disagreements. Both communities held meetings that began and ended with prayer, in the first community, each participant in the meeting spoke. Everyone heard and gave counsel. The result was an agreement that allowed all of the participants to remain in the community without feeling compromised or defeated. In the other community, members attended the meeting, but then they talked and criticized one another behind their backs, and no one had a say, no one was heard, and community was diminished. Here was the distinction between the two communities, according to the author. The second community received occasional sermons or admonishments to love one another, but they did not voluntarily and formally commit to any behavioral principle of that nature. Meanwhile, the first community had a written behavioral covenant in place that was read aloud often and constantly enacted. The community lived in covenant with one another and chose to act accordingly something to consider. So our UUCP covenant concludes with a commitment to help one another. We all need help at times, and helping takes many forms, from assistance with an event, staffing a table, leading a class, or lending a listening ear and shoulder to cry on. As I said earlier, we do the work of this congregation. Back in the book Becoming Wise, a Unitarian Universalist chaplain named Kate Braystrup shares her view of God. For Braystrup, the idea that God is love has everything to do with beliefs or transcendence and everything to do with people and actions. Tippett asks Chaplain Braystrup how she maintains her belief in God in a world full of pain and violence and suffering, including harm done by human beings against other human beings, often. Braystrup responds that death and suffering are a given for all of us, but people showing up for one another and offering care and love is not a given. So when that happens, those people who show up are embodying a higher power. 
Braystrip says, if someone asks, where was God in this, I'll say God was in all the people that came to help. Braystrip concludes, the question isn't whether we're going to have to do hard, awful things, because we are. We all are. The question is whether we have to do them alone. So in this covenantal community, we do not have to bear the difficult times alone, and we are here to help one another. But I would argue that we really cannot stop there within our own congregation. The video that we watched earlier described our UU movement as one that calls you to put more faith in yourself, your community, and your beliefs. As we lean into our beliefs, our values, and our covenant, we draw our circles wide and wider still. To hearken to the civil rights activist Vincent Harding that I shared about earlier, we consider our place in the world, our responsibilities to each other, and to the world itself. Our covenant induces us to build a beloved community that expands beyond our walls. The term beloved community, which we use often, was coined by the philosopher and theologian Josiah Royce and was popularized by Dr. King. King used the term to refer to a society where, quote, caring and compassion drive political policies that support the worldwide elimination of poverty and hunger and all forms of bigotry and violence. At its core, the beloved community is an engine of reconciliation, end quote. A position of openness, curiosity, and understanding is essential to a diverse and evolving society such as ours. But these types of spaces seem less likely and less com common in recent times. It is becoming increasingly apparent that as a nation, we are divided uh, even on the understanding of this, this country and what it is all about. And maybe we really always have been divided on that, but we haven't talked about it as much. A recent article in The Guardian asserts that there are two mutually incompatible views of the US. The first view is that this is a pluralistic society where everyone has equal protection under the law. The second view is that this is a promised land for European Christians. The second view is held by believers in or supporters of something known as Christian nationalism. The Guardian article observes that the Alabama Supreme Court's recent IVF ruling belies the court's commitment to Christian nationalism, which is the belief that the U.S. should be an explicitly Christian country and its laws should reflect that. I have previously shared about the dangerous rise of Christian nationalism in the news. Maybe some of you have heard that or been following it. Recent polling indicates that about 30% of Americans support tenets of Christian nationalism agreeing with statements such as the U.S. government should declare America a Christian nation. Christian nationalism is observed in the form of certain recent legal and political conquests, such as the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the proliferation of efforts targeting sex education and LGBTQ plus rights, and the erosion of separation of church and state protections in schools. The Guardian article continues, the post-Roe skirmish over abortion rights illustrates the Christian nationalist tendency to not only cast issues in binary terms, but to believe that the opposing side is a force of literal evil. The article quotes Matthew Taylor, a Protestant scholar at the Institute for Islamic Christian and Jewish Studies and author of an upcoming book about Christian extremism, which is called The Violent Take It by Force. Taylor says there is no dialogue with the other side in their mind. You never compromise with demons. You exercise demons. So at a time when some folks are seeing not fellow people, but demons among us, we you use offer an important vital perspective, a non-dogmatic religious community that celebrates diversity, encourages seeking, and acknowledges the fallibility in all of us, while maintaining hope and the opportunity for change and growth throughout life. I really cannot say enough about the dangers of Christian nationalism, specifically white Christian nationalism, which is really what we're talking about. I cannot stress enough how detrimental this worldview is to freedom, democracy, human rights, equity, diversity, security, and really every other value that we treasure and that we need in order to survive. But to keep this talk focused on covenant, which I started off with and will continue with, our covenant serves as a model 
for how we live here in this building and out in the greater world. Recognizing the humanity in each of us, seeking truth, <coughs> focusing on service and helpfulness, but above all, love and not hate. We are not spectators. We draw on our eight principles and our history of social witness to center us and to fortify us in the work. We you use recognize that we are interconnected and what affects one of us affects all of us. The UUA says it this way, covenant is the silk that joins Unitarian Universalist congregations, communities, and individuals together in a web of interconnectedness. The practice of promising to walk together is the core of our creedless faith. Thank you, Lauren. Our uh, closing hymn is We Shall Be Known. Uh, the words are going to be on the slides, so please join us. Oh. Please stand as you're able. Thank you. Our closing words are from Jean M. Rowe. We have a calling in this world. We are called to honor diversity, to respect differences with dignity, and to challenge those who would forbid it. We are people of a wide path let us be wide in affection and go on our way in peace. Thank you. Mm -hmm.